and, and public education advocate who is most known for his love of Wu-Tang. You may have seen the popular mask on Twitter uh, <laughs> and Star Wars. He had an amazing <laughs> uh, 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 media uh, photo that you guys should check out. Um, and if you follow his Twitter, you'll also see that he has a fierce and relentless commitment uh, to, to children and working families. And he is going to be representing the Bronx and Westchester as New York 16's next congressman. Um, and I will save my introduction for, for Representative Elect Bush when she comes on, but we're going to be asking them both some questions that we prepared and those that you have sent in. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Congressman Elect Bowman. <laughs> What's up? What's up, Rojas? How you doing? I mean, wow, we've come a long way, haven't we? We have. It's crazy. <laughs> it's really crazy, but it's great to see you as always, and it's great to be here with with JD and all of the supporters. Let's get started. What what questions do you have? I'm ready. I'm ready. Absolutely. All right. So one of the first ones is there are a lot of dynamics at play during primaries, and there's been some debate about primaries being too divisive um, or, or other sort of words like that. I assume people probably told you it wasn't the time for primaries. We have to focus on Republicans. But if there weren't primary challengers, there would be no Congressman Bowman or Congresswoman Bush. So now that you've gone through this whole process in reflection, how do you think primaries help or or not and and also not hurt the Democratic Party? So primaries help to grow the electorate. Uh, they help to build community. They help to get people involved and engaged and to bring people together. Uh, in our district, there are over 400,000 registered Democrats. But during the primary in 2018, only 30,000 of those registered Democrats voted, despite there being four people in the race. And Congressman Engel won that primary with 22,000 votes. And this is someone who had been in office for 31 years. So when someone has been in office so long and hasn't engaged the entire community, the entire district, and hasn't worked to really fight for working class people and build power and grow the electorate, there's a certain amount of apathy and despair that sets in with registered voters in that district. And what primaries have the potential of doing is really tapping into the unlimited potential of the electorate within a particular district. And our goal and our focus from the very beginning was to knock on the doors of the people who have been most ignored, most neglected, most marginalized, and really listen to them and learn from them and allow their narrative to dictate the policy platforms that we are gonna be fighting for and bring conversations like Medicare for All and the Green New Deal and humane immigration reform and fully funding our public schools and criminal justice reform, not just bring those conversations to them, but allow them to bring it to us uh, and bridging those gaps that have been, been far too wide for too long. Uh, so that's what happened in our race. You know, we tripled voter turnout, we tripled turnout amongst young people and people of color, and we won by 16 points against a 31 year incumbent that no one thought we had a chance uh, to beat. So primaries matter. They do, that's right. And I love the unlimited potential, right? Because if you don't talk to people, you don't actually know, not only if they're gonna go vote for you, but what they can bring to the table. And as AOC and, I'm, and you've said, and all of our members inside, Everybody, every constituent, every person has something to bring. So uh, my next question also was submitted. Um, since winning your election and finishing new member orientation, which I believe you finished this past month, um, as you learn more about what to expect heading in to being sworn in, how have your expectations and ambitions of your time in Congress changed since you first announced your campaign? And maybe what, what else have you sort of learned along the way? Um, ambitions have grown um, and expectations have grown uh, since we've gotten in and since we've been a part of orientation. I mean, we have two QAnon supporters that won their elections in Georgia 
who are here in Congress refusing to wear masks and others who wanna bring guns into the Capitol and keep them in their office. And we have 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump and Donald Trump's vote support and vote total here in New York City, the most democratic city in the country grew from 2016 to 2020. So we have to be bolder, we have to be more visionary, we have to fight more every single day to grow this movement in every corner of the country because their movement is growing as, as, as much disinformation and lies and delusion that Donald Trump has spewed, he's actually grown uh, the support for the Republican Party and not just the Republican Party, but those who are completely disillusioned within the party and within the country. And it's because many in the country just want to blow the whole system up. So for us to rescue democracy, give it a second chance, grow our electorate, grow our power, we have to be bolder and more engaged on a day-to-day -day basis. So no, my, my ambition, my vision, the things I believe are possible has grown. Um, you know, again, you know, Vice President-elect, excuse me, President-elect Joe Biden, way better than Donald Trump and is surrounding himself with people that it seems we can work with and continue to push to be more progressive. And now I am I have a seat at that table. I'm in communication with the Biden transition team on a consistent basis. I'm in a communication with Democratic leadership on a consistent basis, pushing the agenda of the things the people need most in this district and across the country. So more ambitious, not less. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and also, you know, beyond just the as a party, right? And I think this is going to be crucial with the Biden and Harris administration, just given the stakes of everything, we need immediate, tangible results for people. Um, especially right now, right now, as soon as possible, um, and, and are prepared to utilize and I know you've said this before, any and every tool uh, on the table for the federal or the executive branch there. So what are your, and, and you sort of allude to this at the end of your question, but what are the expectations for the Biden administration that you have and how should progressives continue to organize to push for our policy priorities, sort of understanding you know, what the landscape looks like right now? So before I even go to expectations for the Biden administration, I think about us. I think about us as a progressive movement and us coming together and working together each and every day to strategize around how to put more pressure on Biden and leadership to do what's right for the American people. Obviously, first and foremost, we have to respond to COVID. We have to keep people safe and healthy and in their homes and food on the table and just make sure that we can come out of this uh, a lot a lot better than where we are now. I mean, we have over 300,000 dead. It's been a nightmare. Uh, we have to respond to COVID accordingly. But then after that, cancel student debt. Biden has the power to do it through executive action right out the gate. Let's get to a $15 minimum wage. Let's get to a federal jobs guarantee. Let's deal with the issue of wealth inequality. There's so much that we need to do. Let's stop uh, fracking and drilling on American soil. Let's begin to invest to two trillion trillion dollars in environmental justice. Uh, let's grow immigration. Let's let's reverse Trump's executive orders. Like there's so much that we need to do uh, right away, and I expect uh, President elect Biden to do it all. But he's not going to do it all, and leadership isn't going to do anything if we don't continue to organize, work together, and push them. And before we even get to that, can we all on this call put our energy towards winning two? Senate seats in Georgia, because guess what? They're not the most progressive, I know. But if they win, Mitch McConnell, who's evil, will be disempowered. And it will, it will give us a lot more power in the House to push bold, progressive legislation that will ultimately pass the Senate without Mitch McConnell in power. So, you know, Georgia's on my mind right now as well. Uh, because we can get a lot more done if we could win those two seats uh, in Georgia. 
That's absolutely right. I, I think now, especially as a as a young movement, Justice Democrats, when we're pushing um, to 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 actually get folks into Congress, now we have to deliver, and we need to set ourselves up for the best possible set of scenarios to be able to actually govern um, for the majority that that elected us. And if we get those two Senate seats in Georgia, plus we continue to put. Uh, pressure on the Biden administration, we can do transformative things and actually take millions of people out of poverty um, and, and solve this crisis uh, or the pandemic. So um, my final question, because I want to make sure that you, you get off at the time uh, mm -hmm. that, that we set out, how did you ultimately get convinced <laughs> that, okay, I'm going to put my whole life on hold for a year, I'm going to upset my wife, the kids a little bit, um, and do this long shot out there thing and, and try to run for Congress against a 31 year incumbent. And I know I'm a little biased because I, I remember the conversation. <laughs> uh, I don't know that when you asked the question that way, I, my first response is I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea how I ultimately became convinced to do this. I mean, you know, I remember sitting with you and Bilal and um, oh, don't tell me who else was there. Oh man, she she's not with the team Naseem. anymore. Who? Well, she's watching right now, Nasim on our board. Nasim, yes, you Bilal, Nasim. I remember us sitting there in Starbucks, uh, in Bay Plaza, in the district near Co-op City, having this conversation. And quite honestly, I think it's because I believed in you all. You know, I believed in what you were saying, how I felt around you, your energy, your passion, your your love, um, what you had already done um, with, with Alex in 2018. Yeah, I think in that moment, I believed more in y'all than anything else. Um, even though I, I kind of knew I, I could have a shot, but yeah, it was it was it was faith. It was it was faith in you all and faith in 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 the moment and the movement, I guess. And it was, you know, it wasn't my wife. She wasn't on board uh, <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so it wasn't her. It's funny. In a recent conversation, we were out at dinner. We finally had a date night, which we don't you don't get to have much when you get married and you have kids. So we had a date night. And at the date night, she said she was 90 percent sure I was crazy and 90% sure, and she used the word, the number 90%, I was going to lose. <laughs> so I was like, what? Come on, you've been with me for how many years? I ain't never lost nothing. What you talking about? I wasn't going to lose, but she wasn't feeling that. Um, but yeah, I, I believed in y'all, man. And, and yeah, I believed in y'all. I, I believed in what you did with Alex. I believed in that moment. And listen, make no mistake about it. This is a leap of faith. Uh, it really is. But but if you have faith in what's possible, and 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 faith in humanity, and 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 true love for humanity and and the world, then you gotta fucking do it, yo. You gotta just do it, man. And. and you know, I had been in education 20 years and a middle school principal 10 years, a school that I founded, a, a, a district school, a public school that I founded. And I resigned that position. And I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. I left that position and and, and I, I took out all of my, my retirement savings. I, 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 I borrowed it. Uh, took out any savings that I had, invested it in, in paying my bills and and we went for it and we fucking changed the world, yo. So yeah, man, it's, 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 it's pretty incredible. And now we get to be here and do this work and, and, and during a pandemic and, and we beat Trump and get him out of here. But now we got, we got a lot more work to do. So it, it's, it's incredible. Are, are you crying, Rojas? Are you crying? <laughs> you're, making me, you're making me cry. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, I hope everybody before before you go, I hope every single person that that's on this call hears what he just said, which is true. And I I'm a founding member here. I was the first staffer at uh, Brand New Congress and Justice Democrats, and it's true. 
there are so many things in our political system and just in life, right, that are stacked against us as everyday people, as working people. And sometimes really all that secret sauce is, is having faith and have, being able to um, sacrifice just a little bit more to believe in that vision that you can see so clearly, but maybe not everybody else yeah. can. And um, it is, you know, I, I hope that that's all of us. It's not just me. That's all of our supporters that have given so much yes. over the past few years, especially the ones that have been with us since the very beginning. So it just uh, gives me goosebumps too, hearing yes, you describe yes. it like that. Cause that's what it felt. It felt like magic too, when, when we yes. all came together. And it just shows again, like, you know, uh, collective power, right? When you are not just, you know, it obviously everybody has the power to, as an individual change thing, but it really is when we can come together as people and we recognize what our strength is and can overcome those obstacles and prove victories like yours, you are representative of, of so much of, of, of all of the people on this call. So thank you. Thank you, Congressman-elect Bowman for being here. Thank I love you. you. Love, <laughs> love you and, and everything that you're going to accomplish. And we will be here steadfast, ready to, to continue to support as you get sworn in on January 3rd. Absolutely. I love you too, Rojas. I love JD. Shout out to Walid and Bilal and Nassim and Ava and Amira and my whole crew. Listen, we need JD to grow exponentially because this can't just be about primaries and all of that. Listen, we got to we got to challenge Republicans in swing states. We got to take over the Senate. We got to run for governor. We got to run for state house like we got to take it over because Corey will tell you we got QAnon supporters in Congress, yo. Shit is crazy right now. So we need JD to come through strong. So please support uh, JD, support what we're doing. Corey's the original JD, so I know she's going to drop some jewels on y'all. But love you, Rojas. Love you, Corey. I'll see y'all soon. Peace and love, y'all. We'll talk soon. Bye. <laughs> All right. That's perfect timing. Uh, our next special just guest just arrived. To kick it off, I'm going to kick it off to you in just a minute, Corey. Um, but, you know, like Jamal just said, Corey was our first recruited Justice Democrat ever uh, in 2017 when we first launched the organization from day one. Um, before it popped off this year, the heart and soul of her campaign was about the justice for Black lives, centering the Black Lives Matter movement and policing. Um, as a single mother, as a pastor, as a nurse, as an activist, she is the people that she represents in every sense of the word. Uh, and she's going to be representing St. Louis and Ferguson as the first black woman ever to represent Missouri in Congress in the first district. Um, we are so honored to, to have you, Corey. Um, we're gonna get into for the next 15 minutes, some questions and answers that we've prepared as well as some of our supporters have sent in, uh, but feel free to, to, to jump in or add anything else that you want. But the first question that I've got for you um, is that primaries aren't popular uh, necessarily with the establishment uh, quite yet. Um, and that's probably an understatement, uh, but I, I assume people have probably told you um, it wasn't time for primaries uh, because we have to focus on Republicans, especially in a state like Missouri. Uh, so, but if there weren't primary challengers at the same time, right, there would be no Congressman Bowman or there wouldn't be a Congresswoman Bush. So how do you think, same question that we asked uh, Jamal, how do you think primaries uh, help and not hurt the Democratic Party and are actually probably good for it? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you all so much. Thank you for the invite, um, Alex, and, you know, uh, Justice Dems, you all are my home. And uh, we go so far back and life is so different than it was the first day that I connected with you all. Um, the first moment that someone said, I nominated you to Justice Democrats. Uh, and, you know, that was like a different world, you know. Um, and I'm here right now because I said that I could not run if I didn't have you all's help because I could not bear running for office again, working full time, 
trying to take care of my kids and trying to raise money and doing it all on my own. I couldn't bear doing it again. And so now we're here. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, and that is part of the, that is part of it right there. You know, when people say you shouldn't primary awake to the right time and all of that, the issue is, and I say it all the time, while you're playing these games, people die. People die, people are hungry, people don't have clean water, people are sleeping on the street, you know, while we're waiting on the right time to primary someone. And the thing is, we primary people when we see that there is failed leadership, that there is community neglect, that there are things that the community has been crying out for that they haven't received. Now, I just want to be clear. There is no plot to go and, you know, we want to go after these particular people and tear them down. And that is nothing like what it really is at all. Like, and personally, I could care less about that. I, I don't, you know, it, it, what, what I cared about. And I'm so glad that you all took the chance on me back then in, um, for 2018 and also for 2020 because the people of my district deserve someone who's going to listen, someone who's of the people from the streets like them, like so many of them, not all of them, but like so many of them, someone who's gone through the things and the struggles and the issues and the problems, had all the adversity that they've gone through. So they deserve to have somebody that cares enough to say, I'll be vulnerable for you if you get what you need. And you don't have to have that in a, in, in a, in a, a Congress person as long as your congressperson is doing the work. St. Louis has that now because JD stood with me. And so that, so it helps. So it helps um, the Democrats because we get people who are in the now moment for what the people need. We got to continue to move forward. This thing is a movement. You got to move. And if you're not willing to move, then you need to step aside because the people need us and they need us now. Um, the way that it hurts, is people like your friend can't won't is not here anymore. Well, call them. You know, you know it it it, it hurts because you can't you, you may not be able to con to control situations or people or, or 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 the way that you're used to doing it. But that's okay because times have to change. People have changed. Look, let me tell you. When I sit down to get on my computer and I and I'll shut up. I know you have other questions, but. No. When I sit down to get on my computer, I do not have to do the dial-up thing like we had to do years ago when I first started to get change happened. Somebody had to move out of the way for change to happen. So in the same way, this is a good thing. Yep, no, that that's right. And I think the the big thing there is urgency. You bring urgent leadership, not we have time to 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 waste for someone else to solve this big problem that requires national orchestration it is the buck stops here mentality. And um, I think that is so, so incredibly critical and is what is going to be so unique about you, especially entering the halls of Congress. Um, so I guess my that sort of leads into my next question about how you plan on working with progressives in Congress to hold the Biden-Harris administration accountable to your community and deliver results on some of these bold progressive agenda items that you've been championing. And I know that you've already sort of gotten to work um, working with the Biden-Harris administration to try and make sure that your constituents' voices are, are represented. Right, well, I am no respecter of persons. You know, I, as much as I honor you know, I honor our former president. I honor our, you know, president-elect. I honor our, you know, VP-elect. But I honor that work that they've done and what we think that they could do. But I don't, I'm not a respecter of persons to where I got to bow down to what you're doing or bow down to you, not at all, because my people deserve more than that. And so that has to be my focus. So are we going to work together? Absolutely. But we're going to work together. I don't, I'm not coming to you like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I'm in the room and I'm so glad. And no, I'm not coming to you like that. I'm coming to you like, look, 24 kids in my district just, got, just was murdered, you know, um, at, the, at the hands of gun violence. Somebody's got to do something. I'm coming to you like, you know, we just had, 
you know, people died sleeping out on the street because it was freezing cold outside, you know, not too far from my home. And I'm coming to you like this is what's happened. I'm coming to you like the maternal mortality rate in my community is four to one to a white woman and the um, the black maternal mortality rate and the black um the uh, black infant mortality rate is six to one um, to, to that of a white baby in my community and nobody's doing anything. And so this, these are our needs. I'm trying to save a life. So that's how I'm going to work with them is being very clear, being very real. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, uh, I know I'm not going to be starstruck and, and, and I'm not going to hold my tongue because I'm so grateful to be in the room. No, St. Louis voted me in the room. And so I got in the room, room the same way that they got in the room by the people voting. And so I'm not going to bow down just because I'm excited to be. No, 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 no. I'm in the room and I'm listen to them. And I expect them to listen to me the same. I'm listen to them. And I expect them to listen to me the same. I'm no less than them because I got people that need, that have a need. And those are the same people that they um, serve as well. So that's how I'm going to do it. And also, um, I think when people hear, when everybody may not understand what people are going through because they haven't been there. That, that is the case sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes that is the case. Well, I'm bringing that lived experience in the room and to the point to where I hope it can pull on some compassion strings and hope that it can it can compel them to act differently. And so you can't come to me and say, hey, this is what we want to do for the unhoused. You know, if you're not willing to to go deep into what the unhoused really go through. And are you talking to the unhoused? Are you talking to people that think that they know they read a book or went to a class? That's how we're going to do it. Yeah, that. That's totally right. And I mean, a lot of people when we've talked, you know, before about your race with with other supporters or voters or, or donors. I mean, we also talk about how St. Louis before the pandemic has been has been on a decline for over 15 years when you think of stagnating wages, job opportunity. But once you step into the city of St. Louis, right, and I don't have to tell you, the life expectancy gap is 20 years between black and white people. So it it falls on hollow ears that all of a sudden, now that we've defeated Trump, we've got to get to work. This is about making sure that we're not just reversing the damage that Trump has done, but also reimagining the future and bringing it in. So to that point, since winning your election, and I asked the same question to Jamal, I know that you guys just finished new member orientation this past month, which is, oh, I can't wait to watch you guys get sworn in. Um, but as you learn more before you get sworn in or as you head towards it, how have some of those expectations, right? The, the, and, and ambitions in Congress changed since maybe you first announced your campaign and what have you learned so far as part of the process that's sort of going towards how you're planning strategically next year? Yeah, so, well, one thing is I thought that um, I was just going to be so disliked and just treated like, you know, uh, um, just like somebody that people didn't want to be around. Uh, but that hasn't been the case. Uh, we, I, I walked in the door to orientation and meeting so many, and even before that, after the win, so many Congress members reaching out you know, and it was like, you know, you're one of us now, you know, I know we don't agree here. We don't see eye to eye here, but we're going to work together. So I want to extend a welcome to you. And we've had, we've been able to work that way. Uh, and, and even when things are in the media and they sound like, oh, these people are fighting, but then we're on the phone, you know, later on talking about those things and we're able to work together. Uh, so that's one thing that, that was just definitely been different. The other thing is, you know, I I had no clue that uh, this money situation would be what it, what it is. Like nobody tells you, at least because we've had the same person for so long. You know, there was nobody to ask. You know, what happens when you win? And then it's like, okay, well, you can't work a full time job. How do you pay your bills? How do you support yourself? That's been a, that's a huge thing. And then not only that, moving. You know, I had to move into a, a place in D.C you know, you have to get everything. So like that, you know, just, you know, buying bread for a second place, buying, buying, you know, all of that, buying toilet paper, buying, you know, it's a, it, you know, having a second home, you know, finding the wardrobe. I talked about the wardrobe, you know, it is, it is a life, it's a whole other life on top of the life that you have, but then you're also doing it in a place of, of the public eye and with so much scrutiny 
And then people attack you for things that they don't even know about, that they don't even understand. And I think that, and so that is something that I wasn't prepared for. I'm used to the racists attacking me. I'm used to people that disagree with me attacking me. What I'm not used to is people who are on the same side as me attacking me for something that they don't even understand. Like that's been a, that, that thing has been, you know, so I'm learning now how to work together with my sisters, especially the squad um, and uh, squad 2.0, <laughs> you know, added my brother, Jamal and my dad, you know, how we can work together. Um, and so I want people to know Ayanna Presley, um, AOC, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, um, even Pramila Jayapal have been so open and so welcoming and so helpful you know, so, so, so helpful. And so I, I want people to know this because people put their mouths on them and slam them so much, but I need people to understand that all of us, are, all of us are JD. Um, I don't know about Pamela, but the rest of us are. They have been so much the help that I needed to be able to get through this time. And so I'm just asking people to lay off of my sisters because you just never know because they fight, I've seen them fight so hard. They fight so hard for people, for people they don't know. They fight so hard for not only their communities, but other communities that are maybe affected the same way. They're fighting for you. They're fighting for your today. They're fighting for your tomorrow. You may not agree with every single thing, but let's face it, you don't agree with your partner every single day. You don't even agree every, you know, every hour, you know? So let's be clear, support these Justice Dems doing the work, forget all the noise. We are about the people and bringing home the liberals. That, that's absolutely right. Well, Corey, I know that you've got a very tight schedule. Thank you so much for blessing us with your presence. And you're absolutely right. Our commitment as Justice Democrats and our supporters is going to be as you get sworn in next year and you tell us, hey, this is what you need help with to make sure that you're getting what you need on the inside done we will be there to support you all. And, you know, as you just mentioned, there is going to be so many more moments, whether it's coming from our own side in the establishment or the far right, that will do everything and anything they can to pit ourselves against each other because the inactivity, the lack of progress helps, only helps the McConnell. It only helps uh, everyone that, that's not in our movement, quite frankly, and sadly working people lose. Uh, so it's extra diligent on all of us to be as uh, aware of all of those things as possible. And I know at Justice Democrats, we do our best to, to do that too. And from Pramila to the rest of the squad, to Roe, who's also a Justice Democrat, um, we're, we're, we're looking forward to backing you guys all up <laughs> come, come next year. So yeah, you guys feel, feel the love. Um, but I will let you go. Thank you so much, Corey, for, for being here. Uh, and thank you all again who, who are tuning in uh, for joining us this evening. It's been so incredibly special. I'm sorry I even teared up, but it has been, uh, Corey, Corey, Corey knows this. It's been a long, um, it's been a long few years to get here. Um, and it is, uh, I'm, I get to go into our accomplishments now and get to brag about all the work that my incredible small but mighty team did for 2020. Um, and also what you guys all helped us do. So, so Becca, I'm not sure if you're able to, to pop on the next slide, but we can, we can start going through some of what we did together <laughs> this year. And let me make sure that I see it too. Awesome, cool. Well, um, it looks like it's still loading a little bit, but those are some headlines. Uh, and and I, there's not too, too many slides. We'll go through them. Um, really quickly, but uh, yeah, check out all of these headlines, right? This is one of the very, of dozens, if not hundreds of press articles that not just Justice Democrats, but all, or Justice Democrats as an organization, but also Justice Democrats like Cori Bush, like Jamal Bowman, like Marie Newman, and the squad getting resoundingly reelected. We have gotten so, so, so many victories, um, you know, whether it was recruiting, Corey and Jamal um, helping push Marie over the finish line when she literally had to, in a week, <laughs> turn her whole field program from in-person to digital. Um, and before that, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in 2018. 
Um, and so our two previous candidate recruitment drives uh, prior to, to this led to the incredible nominations of these working class leaders by people in their community. Um, and just to share a little bit of, of the background of uh, what moments like this, the kickoff events ha like these have, have sort of triggered are, you know, um, J J uh, Jamal Bowman being nominated. Uh, actually, I'll get into that in a little bit. My bad. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll get into those stories in a little bit. But basically, whether it's Jamal being nominated by an, a fellow education activist, Corey was nominated by dozens of activists for her work, uh, you know, after 2014 and when she had run the first time. Jessica Cisneros was nominated by uh, her high school teacher after we specifically targeted uh, a local ad in her district. Um, and AOC was nominated by her brother. So this moment of us talking about our nomination process and our form and getting it out to as many people as possible has what's allowed um, all you know us to continue to build in Congress. So the difference here though, and Jamal alluded to this earlier by just having faith in a lot of cases, right? Is believing in these folks from the very beginning, virtually when no one else does, because what we're trying to do is, is politics differently um, as opposed to seeking out those who can afford to run or those that are deemed in sort of the next line of the political hierarchy. We're going to be recruiting everyday working Americans such as nurses, um, principals and community. Oh, Becca, you can actually go back. We're, we're not there yet. Um, you can go back two slides. Yeah, you can leave it there. Um, and so what each of these Justice Democrats represents is progressive policy change in our collective power as a movement to overcome decades of establishment institutions um, and start to build true independent political power that can transform the Democratic Party. So the slide that that Becca just put on the screen kind of shows, you know, just just what some of the, the the policy work outside of the actual recruitment work and and all of the things that make a campaign go. Um, do. So on the policy side in just the past few years, uh, Justice Democrats with your all support have helped shape the national agenda by advancing issues like a Green New Deal alongside our allies like the Sunrise Movement, uh, Medicare for All with folks like the National Nurses United, uh, justice reform supporting the broader movement of change that Corey and Jamal and so many others are a part of for Black Lives Matter, and you know pushing as best as we can these issues to the top of the national agenda. And the way that we've done that is largely through these competitive democratic primaries. Um, they've become sort of these larger ideological litmus tests um, you know within our party to that that sort of creates that pressure to move on the inside that moves incumbents on a position and inspires popular support so not only like I said is there an incredible amount of of just campaign field work uh, local organizing work while campaigning during the pandemic especially this cycle it also required a lot of communications and a lot of political work that we were able to scale up significantly post AOC's victory in 2018. Um, so just to pull out some examples of, of what that looked like, you can see it sort of on, on, on the screen there. Um, for, the, for Jamal's race, we worked really closely with uh, different allies on the Hill and on the outside, including folks that we can't really name, but we successfully were able to move uh, Engel's position on the U.S. support for the Saudi war in Yemen. Uh, we showed friction on Israel-Palestine within the Democratic caucus, which was really important, especially for this issue that, that you know, a lot of times our party uh, doesn't always prioritize. So the, the, we also, in addition to some of the foreign policy being a huge, a huge um, key, key point here, when I say, oh, I see someone meant, so uh, showed friction, it just means basically what I meant was was that it showed that there was, there's a conversation to be had within the Democratic Party around foreign policy and what it means to be a progressive in foreign policy, especially around the issue around Israel and, and, and Palestine. So we were really proud that our Justice Democrats in Congress are really leading uh, the, the way there. And also in Jamal's race, uh, justice reform became such a big, uh, a big issue, especially after Elliot Engel's hot mic moment within the Democratic Party that was also embedded throughout. 
Uh, for Jessica Cisneros' race, she came within 2,700 votes of unseating a, a 19 plus or a multi-term incumbent, Representative Henry Cuellar, uh, Trump's favorite Democrat. Uh, and that was a race where we focused a lot on immigration and climate. Um, and and Cuellar uh, ended up even running ads about how strong of a progressive he was on climate action. Um, and there were multiple stories that were able to be secured around border militarization. Um, and he's even eventually came out strongly against the wall despite voting to fund it multiple times. And that's going to really matter, especially cutting into to next year. Um, for Corey, uh, obviously the Black Lives Matter movement was so central uh, and justice in policing was so central to the campaign that all of the, the, the work, her winning was so huge, I think, to, to the movement there. Um, and then Ale May Holyoke Mayor Alex Morris versus Representative Richard Neal. This was a referendum before it became about something else, about the power of the healthcare industrial uh, industrial complex and surprise billing. Um, and so again, you know, everyone now, when when we fast forward to conversations around uh, how Schumer is starting to turn progressive or or is afraid of of a primary, it, you know, uh, or starting to 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 be more progressive, you know, that's because he's scared of a primary challenge taking place in his backyard. So what each of these wins and losses, right, doesn't sometimes even when we lose, we win. It amounts to a huge amount of leverage for for our movement. Um, so Becca, you can go to the next slide now. Uh, but here's here's how we here. What do we actually do um, to be able to to get this done? And that's why you guys are, are all here. Uh, we what what truly makes us unique. You can go to the next slide, Becca. Uh, is our ability to recruit these incredible working class leaders to run as part of this broader progressive movement, while also being extremely intentional about where we participate, which is different from when we first launched. Um, so as we've said before, our process is, is sort of part art, part science. The art part of our candidate recruitment process is getting creative about crowdsourcing all of the nominations uh, nationwide that, that are hopefully starting to come in tonight uh, through our nomination form, which I'll go over in a sec, but it's at justicedemocrats.com slash nominate, uh, because you never know who will come through. Like I mentioned before, Jessica Cisneros, uh, was nominated by her high school teacher after we took out a very targeted local ad and in a local newspaper, um, in addition to, to dozens of other people that, that have gotten nominated. But just to show you how much we focus on trying to get that nomination form uh, in as many places as possible um, and be as creative as possible with, with those ideas. And then the science part is really being as precise and as data-driven as possible uh, when prioritizing districts, um, you know, to determine where our progressive base and our grassroots dollars are going to have the largest impact. Um, and a lot of that includes qualitative and quantitative research that's used to gauge whether an incumbent is truly representative of the party, um, you know, assessing all of this demographic information in a given district about uh, the, the election results and, and so much so so much more um, that that we we try to do. Um, but we haven't really been able to get to a point where we can recruit all year round. Uh, we basically are going to be in a sprint as an organization uh, from now through uh, the the you know through basically all of next year because we're we're also monitoring the impact of redistricting. Uh, which is certainly going to have an impact on some of the districts that that we're thinking about, and I'm sure that you all will send in to us. Um, and we're limited by our capacity, which for 2020 meant that we could only recruit uh, uh, two candidates, Jessica Cisneros and Jamal Bowman, because uh, we had recruited Corey technically for the 2018 cycle. Um, so for this cycle, we, we want to obviously build our capacity to be able to do more, uh, and that's going to require uh, us to not only raise a, 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 a significant number of resources to be able to do it, it's also just going to be a ton, a ton of work that we need to your all's help in, in sourcing um, as many nominations as possible. And just to give you an idea of sort of like how, how long this is going to take, every month we are going to be starting, uh, there's going to be a primary starting in March next year. Um, so it's going to take a lot of work uh, and so anything that you can do between now 
uh, and and especially uh, uh, the beginning of, of March next year is going to be super helpful. So you can go to the next slide, Becca. Um, okay, well, I uh, it looks like I we're gonna go to the Q and A portion uh, really quickly. And Becca, I'm so sorry if you've been uh, messaging the Q and A. I'm going to pull it up right now so that way we can do it, and then I will promise I will tell you uh, the next steps right after that. Awesome. Okay, so. For our first question, it looks like this is from Antonio uh, Ibarra. What should we look for when thinking about candidates to nominate? Uh, great question. Um, you know, I the term extraordinary, ordinary American <laughs> always comes to mind because that's really who we're looking for. We're looking for everyday people who uh, are doing really, really incredible work in their community that is truly making a difference in working people's lives. Um, and that can come in many different forms. It doesn't mean that you need to be uh, some, you know, local elected official uh, or that you've had to carry 10 people out of a burning building. Uh, we are really looking for nurses, for uh, community leaders, um, for union workers, for uh, former principals, education activists, um, people that wouldn't nominate themselves, right? We, and, and you'll, if you look at our, uh, if you go to www.com, uh, www.justicedemocrats.com slash nominate, uh, there's also more F a link to an FAQ there, but we don't actually want people to nominate themselves. We want as much as possible to see people that are uh, nominated by folks in their community because you're going to need a lot of support and votes from, from people in your community. Um, all right, I'm going to go to Michael. Are we allowed to nominate someone for Congress who is not in our district? Yes, you totally can. Um, you can nominate, and in fact, I, we would love to just know anyone that you think is even worth having a conversation for. Because a lot of times, like Jamal and, <laughs> and Corey mentioned, like there is a lot of convincing that it takes to get working people to run for Congress, especially servant leaders, especially those that put others before themselves, like Jamal, and it was, was making a tangible difference in children's lives. So why are you gonna go join Congress? It, it takes a lot, so definitely nominate anyone uh, across the country you think is really great. Um, oh, I already, it's already 8.02. I'm gonna answer one more question and then I will do the where we need help. Um, how are progressives going to pressure Biden to go left? He doesn't seem like a candidate for going left. I mean, I completely agree. I think, you know, I'm under no illusion that I think Joe Biden does not, <laughs> we do not see eye to eye uh, necessarily with Joe Biden. And I think what one, like what it's going to take and, and what is actually available from the federal level of, of what we can do, whether it's the executive branch or uh, what, what the house can do. But I do think that, you know, what we've been really focused on in addition to obviously making sure that there are uh, appointments which haven't been necessarily going our way is getting situated. It is, is showing, not telling is, is as much as we can putting out memos, messaging guidance to make sure that we're pointing these leaders to like an actual path forward. Um, because I think that's, that's helpful for our movement. But I think also as progressives, like it's going to take a, a lot of pressure and it's like Jamal and Corey said, it's backing them up. Um, because it is going to be scary because they're going to start building relationships with these people to make sure that they can, they have the ammo that they, they have the support of thousands of people on the outside that are pushing them on, on these policy demands. Uh, and then also as an organization, we'll be saying more in, in the new year about ways uh, that, that we're going to continue to push Biden specifically on executive actions and, and other tools that he can be using. Uh, I wish I could answer so much, so many more. There are so many questions here, but I cannot, unfortunately. It's already been uh, over over an hour. Um, but uh, if you guys have uh, any more questions, especially about the nomination form um, and our candidate recruitment process, you can always email us um, 
at us at justicedemocrats.com uh, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. But I wanna make sure all of you uh, get to <laughs> have your evenings back. Thank you so much for, for being with us, but we need your help. That's the whole point of, of this whole this whole evening has been so incredibly special, but it will now we have to translate all of this momentum into that big sprint that I was just talking about. We need nominations. Uh, you can go right now to justicedemocrats.com slash nominate. Uh, you'll be able to find more information that FAQ I was talking about and the criteria about who we want you all to nominate. Um, anyone, everyone in the district, but again, making sure that we don't get a lot of self nominations that we're really urging uh, those supporters to nominate other people. Uh, the second ask that I have for you all is spread the word by telling at least five friends about this nomination process. Uh, you can go to jdems.us slash recruit. We're also going to drop the link in the chat below. Um, and we want you to spread the word. Um, in addition to actually sending in nominations, a lot of it is just getting the nomination form out there and by far organically is going to be our best bet to getting the most, uh, the best nominations possible in districts across America. So again, help us spread the word by telling five friends uh, about this process. And again, reach out to us anytime if you have any questions about that. And the last thing is that we need folks to sign up to volunteer. Uh, we've got a research team. I mentioned that we're doing a lot of qualitative and quantitative research, uh, both paid and volunteer. So join our monthly calls to learn a little bit more. jdems.us slash volunteer is where you can uh, go ahead and sign up for our research team uh, to be able to help out. But again, the biggest, biggest ask that I have for you all tonight is going to spread the word about this nomination form. At least five, if you can do more, that's going to be incredible. Uh, and I know that with all of your help, we are going to recruit uh, the next generation of diverse working class leaders who are going to win big time in, in 2022 uh, and lay the groundwork for us to continue to do this ongoing as a year round basis uh, for, for beyond. Um, so thank you all so, so incredibly much for being here with us this evening. Um, I, I know I teared up multiple times throughout the night, but it's, it's because, um, you know, uh, our team, our small but mighty team has been working day in and day out, some of us for years, uh, to, to be able to, to, you know, make sure that all of your dollars, all of your hard work, all of your talents actually pay off into victories uh, that are going to be meaningful and impactful to not just our party, but for our entire country. And I hope you all can feel so, so incredibly proud of joining us in that effort because we have made a truly, truly uh, historic year, a historic cycle, and I know that we're gonna do it again in the coming year. So thank you all so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, and for now, we're signing off. Thank you again. Have a great rest of your night and stay safe.